All right, so I'm talking about source maps today. Uh, the first thing is that, uh, so we're, we're now a decade into building UIs, and at this point, the tooling that we started to put together to build our apps has gotten really complicated. Um, you know, at this point, you have a whole bunch of different, what, what we like to think of as compilers. So you no longer have to write JavaScript uh, to put JavaScript on a page. So some examples of this might be CoffeeScript, um, you could also be using something like TypeScript. Uh, Nick has given a lightning talk about that in the past. Um, you could be use some, using something a little bit more obscure. Uh, has anybody heard of Elm? So uh, the, the functional guy here. Uh, so you can do a whole bunch of like functional reactive programming with this. Um, you, could, you could use something like Dart, uh, which is a Google tool. And I'm getting a lot of scowls right now. That's interesting. Uh, uh, it is now just compiling to JavaScript. They're not building into VMs. So there's another uh, class of tools called transpilers. And some of these are things like, um, there's a tool called Babel. It used to be called 6 to 5. But this allows you to take JavaScript that is in the process of being specified through things like the ECMAScript 6 or ECMAScript 7 uh, feature set and compile them down to a subset of JavaScript that would run in browsers today. There's another tool called Tracer. Uh, which Google provides that does something very similar. So if you were to ask me what transpiling is, I couldn't really give you a great definition of that. Um, right? We've been compiling things from one language into another for you know, forever. So I'm not exactly sure what that means, but interesting. <laughs> so this is on the Java, that's on the JavaScript side, but you also don't have to be writing CSS to deploy style sheets to your web apps anymore. So one preprocessor that you might use is less. Uh, there's another one called SAS, uh, which is gaining popularity. There's other ones like Stylus. You know, there's the, you're, the world is your oyster, and there's you know uh, dozens of these that are available. So may, maybe you want to think about post processors. So these are tools that, after you have processed your code, are going to perform some sort of optimization on it. So one of these is uh, mscripten, which we had a lightning talk on a while back, uh, which which compiles your JavaScript into highly optimized almost native type um, uh, a subset of JavaScript. You also have tools like Uglify.js um, or anything that will do some, uh, some sort of minification of your code. This is just a post processor, but it's taking the code that you've written and it is transforming it to remove white space, reduce the number of characters that are being used so that you have a smaller payload. Uh, Auto indexer is another one that's, that's pretty interesting. This allows you to use things like vendor prefixes and just automatically get, they get added to your uh, CSS so that you don't have to think about the WebKit border radiuses and removing them when browsers begin to finally support them. So you have, so this is another really interesting tool. At the very least, one of the, one of the options that you might be using is just to concatenate your scripts together. So if you have a whole bunch of JavaScript files that you're authoring, you might not want to deliver 300 JS files or 200 CSS files. You probably want to smoosh them all together so that you make just a single HTTP request. Um, so at this point, there's a whole bunch of tools that are available. Uh, you have, raise your hand if you're using any of these. That is almost everyone here. That's really interesting. So uh, at this point, you also have a number of build phase tools to, to help automate some of these steps. So uh, the one that we've talked about in the past is something called uh, Grunt. It's just runs on JavaScript. It's kind of interesting. There's other ones along these uh, in this space. Gulp is one that's available. If you're using something like Rails or Grails, you have tools called the Asset Pipeline, which can help automate some of these steps for you. Or you might just be old school and use something like Make, uh, which doesn't have a logo, so I stole the... <laughs> I'm getting one high five up here. So you have a number of tools that are available to you. But now you have a couple of problems. So the first is when you look at the generated code, that gets created as the result of this, it ends up looking like this, where all the white space has been removed. It's really hard to identify exactly what this code is, is doing or how it relates to the code that you wrote, right? And then you have a production bug, so now you've got to try and debug this, <laughs> right? Good luck. You know, at, at this point, you, you are fighting, and you are just praying that, you're in, uh, that the bugs manifest themselves in dev where you might not have optimized it nearly as much as you have. But if it's only in production, then what are you going to do? So this is where source maps uh, come in to help solve some of these problems. So what is a source map? Well, you know, at, a, at the highest level, it's just a bi-directional mapping between 
an original uh, between a generated set of content and the source that created it. So it lets you map this uh, token map in the source maps to this token in the compiled step. So this is this is useful. It works both in CSS and JavaScript. And the way that it works is whenever you aren't using source maps, you know your your transformation pipeline essentially looks like this. So if you are minifying your code, it goes from app.js to app.min.js. With source maps, you get app.min.js, but it also produces this file called a .map file, and it's just app.min.js.map. So uh, in the .min.js file, what you get is here at the very bottom, you get a new line that says source mapping URL, and then it just specifies the path, the HTTP path to the uh, source map file. So if you look at the source map file, you get this giant blob of mess. <laughs> you're never going to look at going to want to look at this if you don't have to, and you're certainly never going to want to author this. You're going to let tools do it for you. But if you're interested in what some of the stuff that's in here, uh, we can kind of look at it. It's just a it's just a big glob of JSON that has just a handful of keys. So the version is set to three. Uh, we're on the third revision of the source map specification. Uh, you have the file, which is that uh, that original min.js file. And then you have a set of sources, and this is just an array. So you have a number of uh, the original sources. So if you're concatenating three files, you'll see all three of those. Next, you have the names. This is just an array of every token that's available in your deployed application. So this type error then call, et cetera. So that goes on forever. At the very bottom, you have this mappings, uh, which I'll talk about in just a second. And then finally, you have sources content. So this is the original source for each of the uh, sources that we just looked at up here. So now, instead of having to uh, send across both the minified version as well as all of your source files, all your source files are now bundled into here. So you only have to deploy two files to production instead of a whole bunch. So this mappings piece is where all the magic happens. This is the location where all uh, where you get that bidirectional mapping. And what you have are these, uh, you know, these just five-digit uh, you know, sets of number or letters. So if you're interested in the actual algorithm that's being used, uh, this is called variable length quantity. Uh, it has a Wikipedia page. I'm not super familiar with it. In fact, don't ask me to explain it because I can't. Uh, the one thing that I know is it allows you, or this is the same algorithm that was used to generate MIDI files and create very small uh, sound, you know, uh, it's a binary representation of text data and it allows you to uh, you know, use it in, in kind of an interesting way. So, in any case, uh, the, the important part is that at this point, it all just works, right? So, so we're at a point in our tooling where if you say, I want to use source maps and you configure all of your tools to generate source maps for you, it's all just going to function uh, properly. So to show you this, I have a couple of demos. So uh, this is just a really simple application uh, where if I click on show presenters, it shows the avatars for uh, all the people that are listed as Nebraska JS presenters, and it's got a little, you know, if I mouse over these things, it will do kind of small little changes. So if I do a view source on this, there you go. Okay. So uh, it's an Angular app, but that part isn't really important. If I look at the example.js, you can see that it's just a big glob of JavaScript. And then I have the source mapping URL. So this is the piece that the source map uh, generator created for us. So now if I go into DevTools and I took a look at the debugger, let me make this a little bigger. So what I've got is my sources over here on the right hand side. So it's got Angular, it's got the router, etc. But now I can see that I have uh, this, oh, it can't get it. So I can see the controllers. So this is the Angular controller. This is one of the original source files that generated uh, this piece. Uh, I can also look at the directive. So if we go back to the code, we can see that there's a little um, you know, custom element that I created in Angular called AnyJS Presenter. Well, the, de the definition for this directive is set up right here, right? And I can put breakpoints in. Uh, so if I, you know, if I reload the page, and I hit, hey, show me these presenters, then I can actually get breakpoints in here. And I can see what the variables are. Uh, 
you know, and all this stuff just kind of works. So well, the source that you're looking at wasn't actually deployed. It was generated from your minified, say, combined with the source map file? Yeah, this file itself uh, that we're looking at is just one of those sources contents that's in the source map. Okay. So it's not on the server? Uh, this is not on the server. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, you can look at the services, uh, and you can put breakpoints, and, you know, if I... If I do the same thing, so if I go to the list presenters and I put a breakpoint, let me see if I need to reload. Yeah, okay. So I can click on that and then I can look at the call stack. So now I can see that this list presenters was being called in my controller. I can see that this is all happening inside of a whole bunch of Angular magic. So it all just works. This is amazing. <laughs> Your source map file does have the source code in it. So if you had some code that you didn't want people to see, you wouldn't want your source map. Uh, yes, if you if you had secret information in your JavaScript, although that's getting deployed anyway, so I'm not sure what your how that would work. Right, you have a couple of options there. So that was on the JavaScript side. One of the things that I also want to show is on the CSS. So let's say that I want to hover over Zach's bearded face here. Uh, so I can see all of the CSS rules that are being presented over here. And the interesting part is, check this out, so it's showing presenters.scss. <coughs> so this is a SAS file. And if I click on that, then I can see uh, the SAS definition. So this shows I'm using a variable called page width. I have some SAS mixins which are just cool enhancements. Uh, and so I can, you know, I'm doing nesting here, so where the hover changes. And I can, you know, go back to, I'll go back to this, you know, and I can change the, uh, the border radius. So maybe if I'm hovering, maybe I want to get rid of, you know, go all the way down to zero. And now I get nice little squares instead. So this is pretty nifty. <laughs> So uh, what you're referring to is the local workspace feature that Chrome DevTools has. No, and even if you don't have that set up, you can, uh, I can like, set a breakpoint and then change the line below the breakpoint and just hit Command S and it will just rerun it through the... Oh, if uh, the JIT compiler does yeah. all of its stuff? Uh, that's a good question. I'm not sure how that works. So did your app just recompile the stats on the server? No. It? So what I showed... Here, I'll pull that up again. So when I was changing this, uh, it's changing the the generated selector. So I can't like modify my SAS variable. To do that, I would need to set up local workspaces, which you can still do with source maps, but this demo doesn't have that in place. So the browser dev tools already know how to read source maps then? Yeah, so I'm using Firefox, um, but uh, other browsers have this as well. But all that you need to do, so it's enabled by default, but this you have this uh, show original sources that's checked if I uncheck it, and then I look at the sources, then all that I see is just the compiled stuff. But I tell it, show me the original sources, and bam, I get all my cool stuff. And then what do you use to compile this code? Is it just Uplify, or? So this, uh, this particular one is concatenating, and it is using Uglify. Uh, so the, and the, the specific tool that I was using was Gulp, but, um, you know, most tools uh, support this stuff out of the box now. Uh, that is just the gulp SAS. I think it's using lib SAS behind the scenes. Yeah, yeah, I'm not familiar. Yeah, I'm not super familiar with Compass. But this particular stack, it all works now. So that part's interesting. Uh, but the, the really cool part is what they call multi-level source maps. So the way that that works is if you have, say that you have, you're writing your code in ECMAScript 6 or CoffeeScript or TypeScript, you're using one of these compile to JS languages. So you can, uh, take, you can take each of those, compile them, concatenate them together, and then minify it, 
all in individual build phases, and source maps will take, it'll, it'll remember its context. So even when you get to the minified version of your code, it will still remember that your original code was ES6 or CoffeeScript or TypeScript or whatever you want. That part just blows my mind. So I need to show you what this looks like. So uh, I have this small little application. Uh, again, it's a little Angular app. Uh, and if we look at the code for it, so uh, what you can see in here is I've got, you know, just a little uh, controller. So this controller, it's an Angular controller, but it's written in ECMAScript 6. So here I'm just defining all this stuff, uh, but I'm using a ES6 class. I have a constructor on it. Uh, I'm using the let variables. Uh, I'm setting up these iterators, right? I'm, you know, all of this stuff would not run natively in browsers, but I've used the Babel transpiler to convert it into something that browsers will run natively. So that's one. Um, but maybe you saw, so again, this is an Angular application. You might have heard that the next version of Angular is going to recommend that you write your application uh, code in TypeScript. Well, maybe you're upset about that or you don't want to write your stuff in TypeScript. So maybe you want to choose CoffeeScript. So you have this available. Uh, and you can see that down here, uh, you can kind of see this. I've got the, you know, it's just showing the squares. So if I look at my CoffeeScript, um, I'm just, you know, defining this. So I have my Angular definition stuff down here. I'm using all the CoffeeScript fanciness, so I'm not putting my parentheses anywhere, uh, you know, defining my controllers. And then I have my class. So I have my constructor, I have my, uh, you know, each of these. And so I'm using the arrow notation, all this, and it's just working out of the box. Right, so you don't you don't have to you don't have to choose, which is kind of fun. Uh, but maybe you do want to use TypeScript. So you have this available. I can take a look at the example too. Uh, I'm you know I'm using the TypeScript definitions. I'm creating it as a module. I have my classes. Uh, you know I have my company, and then I have this important message, which just says, "Please don't hate me just because I'm from Microsoft." So this is all just TypeScript functionality. And uh, at the end of the day, it's all being, oh, don't want to do that. Yeah, so at the end of the day, it's all uh, just being converted into a single uh, .js file. But they're all living you know, in brilliant harmony. So we can all get along. And, and source maps are, are the key to, to solving our language crisis. So that part is nuts. Um, so, so that's that's the the gist of the source map stuff. Uh, I do have one more just kind of uh, uh, wayward path that I want to just talk about. So, has anybody heard of uh, this programming language called Arnold C before? So, I'm seeing a handful of hands being raised. Uh, it's a joke programming language. You know, you wouldn't want to write you wouldn't want to write like production code or anything. Um, you know, it's available on GitHub. Uh, it's like the, the description says that it's an Arnold Schwarzenegger based programming language. Um, this is the hello world for it. So every keyword in Arnold C is a is a uh, catchphrase from an Arnold Schwarzenegger movie. So, <laughs> so your hello world, you, you have to wrap all of your statements in. First, you have to go, it's showtime, and then you have to end it with, you have been terminated. <laughs> uh, the 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 uh, print statement is, talk to the hand. <laughs> so this is your hello world. Uh, if you want to define a variable, you have to call it, so you start with a, get to the chopper! You have A, uh, you, you have a set of statements, so in this case, uh, you have to start with, here's my invitation. Uh, to add something, you use get up, and to multiply, you say, you're fired! And then you end your statements with, enough talk! <laughs> Uh, to declare a variable in general, you just have to yell out, hey, Christmas tree! Uh, and then you yell out, you set us up! And they have uh, two macros uh, for I lied, which is false, and no problemo, which is true. <laughs> so, uh, so in Arnold C, there, are no, there is no order of operations, so it just executes from left to right. <laughs> and there's only... <laughs> So there's, there's only one uh, type in Arnold C, which is a 16-bit integer. Uh, you don't have floats or any of that other fanciness that you would want from, you know, an inferior programming language. <laughs> so 
So Arnold C is great, uh, and and I'm sure that you would all want to write your code, you know, using this this language of the future. But there's two problems. So the first problem is, and I sent out a tweet about this earlier today, but I said I want you to send me your favorite Schwarzenegger one-liner and/or GIF. And so this is great uh, because the one of the first ones that I got was "Get to the chopper," which is a valid keyword uh, in Arnold C. Uh, but one of them that we saw was "It's not a tumor," uh, which is not a keyword in Arnold C. <laughs> so we can see that it's it's a uh, it's you know it's problematic. Uh, I also saw Derek said that I'll be back from the movie Commando, uh, which I'm not exactly sure what to do with that one. I'll be back is available, but uh, I don't know if it's from Commando or not. And then I got some weird responses, like, you know, I'm not sure exactly how you would how you would put this into <laughs> as a keyword, but right. So so we can tell the language is slightly incomplete, which is a problem. I also got just some amazing, uh, you know, animated gifs from this. I, I love this one that Nick sent. They, they asked me to upgrade to Windows 7, but I still but I said I still love Vista, baby. <laughs> I, and this just goes on forever, right? I, <laughs> you guys are amazing. I'm just going to leave this up here for a while. All right. So there's there's a second problem though, which is so this is this is from the Arnold C web page, uh, which is the try it yourself, and so it has your hello world. And but if you look down here, you see that uh, you know this requires Java to run, and so it it runs on the JVM. Right, which is portable, but it's not quite portable enough for what we want. So, I wrote a compiler. <laughs> it's called Arnold C.js, and it compiles from Arnold C to JavaScript. Wait, 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 Matt. Did you do that just for this presentation? I, uh, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> so, but the reason that I'm talking about it at this presentation is that it compiles from Arnold C to JavaScript with source maps. <laughs> So, let's see what this looks like. So this is the same project that we had before, but now we have this fourth one, just called Arnold C. So uh, I want to show you what Arnold, what this looks like before we actually get to it. So now uh, we have this fizzbuzz.arnoldc. So this is <laughs> so this is the uh, <laughs> so so this is the entry point. So you can see that I'm calling the do it now, which executes a function, and I'm saying angular.module. Uh, so this is this is still integrated into Angular, so don't worry. Uh, so I've defined my Arnold module. I'm saying do it now. I'm defining my controller, and then my controller is defined up here. So uh, you know, I'll start. So unfortunately, there's no concept of arrays in Arnold C. So I had to use so I had to use the eval function <laughs> to get it to work. Uh, but but from but from here on out, right? It's all just it, well, it's all just Arnold C, uh, <laughs> right? And so you can kind of see how it goes. So uh, you know, it's checking to see whether or not it's divisible by 15. Uh, it prints out fizzbuzz, etc. And at the very end, I have this print function. So oh, the parameters in Arnold C, each one you have to define on its own line, and it's I need your clothes, your boots, and your motorcycle. So this is parameter one. This is parameter two. Uh, so the talk to the hand allows you to uh, write to that. As that's actually your console.log. So let's actually run this. So if I hit click on Arnold C, so now I've got uh, I've got a breakpoint in here. I can look at the call stack, and I can see that the Arnold C controller it's going through. Uh, you know. At this point, it's not divisible by 3, 5, or 15. So at the very end, and it's just going to print at that value. So if I open this up, if I step over this next piece, it's just printed it out to the console. And it's also going to put it on the accumulator. So I can you know, step through this. I'll keep going. 1, 2, fizz, etc. And at the end, you get a nice. <laughs> Right? And it's printing out FizzBuzz for you. Oh, this is the stupidest thing that I've ever done. <laughs> uh, okay. So, what does your JavaScript look like in that case? 
Uh, that actually, I can show you what that looks like. So, uh, for my Arnold C, let me open this up. I'll go to the sources. And you, you said you wrote the compiler that converts it from Arnold C to JavaScript. Yeah, that's its own interesting story. <laughs> <laughs> so it wraps everything in an iffy. Uh, your prints. So this is this is that print statement where it does a uh, console.log and it also calls accumulator.push. This is my uh, controller. This is that eval statement that I was telling you about. Um, so this is, so in some of this, it's not strictly a one-to-one -one translation. So when you're doing math and you have to make sure that your variables are only showing up in the order of which it works, you can't just, you know, plop them into JavaScript because it's pesky and it knows about its, um, you know, the order of operations. So you have to fake all of that when you're writing your compiler. Uh, so, you know, you also have to round everything because there's no decimals in Arnold C. <laughs> so you actually have to do kind of some, some weird hacks to get it to work. What's the LSE? Uh, this, in total, it produces 69 lines of JavaScript. Uh, in total, there's about 100 lines of Arnold C. <laughs> <laughs> it's only one line when it's minified. So that is the else. Yes, you're correct. <laughs> uh, uh, so the, the if statement is because I'm going to say please, and it just checks to see whether or not it's zero or one. Oh, God, i got to end this. All right. All right. So source maps, let's get back to that. Um, so it's available everywhere. It's turned on by default. Even Internet Explorer has it as, as part of IE11. So uh, most of the tools that you're using these days should support using source maps and going both for CSS and JavaScript. So that's nice. There are still a couple of gotchas that you have to realize. Uh, so the first is if you are using tools like Uglify or the Rails Asset Pipeline or any of those tools that will build stuff for you, make sure that you're using the latest version of all of them because it's only recently that everything began to finally work in tandem. Um, the, a good example of this is when you were using SAS. The only version that worked was the Ruby version of SAS. If you were using the Node.js or the LibSAS version, that only got fixed like two weeks ago. So if you're not, so use the latest version of everything, and stuff should generally work for you. Um, and if you're not, then it'd be time to upgrade. So the second thing is, so I'm generally an aficionado of the uh, Grunt build tool, but for source maps, Gulp just takes the cake. And the reason for this is uh, it has extracted out the source map generation to an API that every other plugin uses, um, which means that all you have to do is just say, I want to use source maps, run it through. Uh, the Babel compiler, run it through Uglify, run it through my, uh, you know, my auto indexer, and then write it all out, and it just works. If you're using uh, Grunt or the Asset Pipeline or any others, they each have each tool has its own API. Sometimes you have to specify that you have inbound source maps. It's just kind of a mess. I mean, once you get it working, then it's fine. But uh, your your easy your easy path to this is using Gulp. Uh, finally, the, or the third is to inline your source's content. Um, Gulp does this out of the box. You might have to tweak it, but that way you don't have to also host your source files um, in order to get it to work. You just have to deploy your minified file and your source map uh, to production, and then everything just kind of works the way you would expect it to. Uh, and finally, I hope that you never have to use this, but there's a nice source map visualization tool which was built, uh, which allows you to, so this shows you your, uh, so in this case, say that I have my coffee script over here. Uh, this will allow you to highlight and hover over each of the tokens uh, and see what was, what was generated as a result of that. So, you know, this inline function, you can kind of just work the way that it works. So if you ever have to like debug source maps, like if you're writing a compiler or something stupid, then, uh, <laughs> then this becomes really useful. But if you're just using source maps, then it all should just work the way that you would expect. Uh, it would, although I, I have crashed this by plugging in my entire thing. Uh, but I can show you what it looks like with Arnold C at some point later on. Yeah. All right, so that's, that, that's all that I got. Uh, any questions? <laughs> that's a really good question. Uh, I mean, the, the real answer is that I was playing around with this at work, and I also wanted to... Well, okay, not the Arnold C stuff, but the source map stuff. Uh, and 
And I also, like, I've never taken a, like, a proper CS compilers class, so I wanted to kind of figure some of this stuff out, and um, I was looking at it, I was like, oh, maybe I could do something on wall code, or, but luckily somebody had kind of the skeleton of the Arnold C stuff available on GitHub. It just didn't generate source maps, and it was kind of broken, so I had to take that, fix it all up, and um, I don't know, I'm, I, I, that's a good question. <laughs> Yeah, so, so the history of source maps is kind of interesting. It was originally uh, proposed by Mozilla. So they just had a handful of folks back in like 2011, 2012 that kind of played around with it because that they realized that they were we were coming to this problem of the, the code that you were authoring wasn't the same stuff as what you were putting into production. So uh, Firefox and Chrome got it at about the same time. Um, Opera got it similar. Safari actually got it fairly uh, recently. And then IE put it all in. So it was originally a Mozilla proposal. There's no like specification for it other than just like a Google Doc, which they're using. Uh, so it's not part of the W3C, but every browser supports it at this point. So it's fairly stable. So I was just wondering, because you said that the IE, IE 11 in the future will start implementing it in the new you know, HTML5 server was going to be seen. We had the HTML5 shift, which you could get to you know, help kind of emulate some of the newer HTML5 things for other browsers. And no, so uh, so for older browsers, because that it's natively built into browsers, um, you're just kind of out of luck. So if you have to, if you have to do your debugging or one of those other tools, then um, you know, uh, good luck. <laughs> I guess. Just quit. Good job. Oh. Yeah, that's a good question. So I guess uh, I'm not aware of any specific tool, but for any of those browsers where it isn't supported, you can always um, take the, you can always take, just download the, you know, the compiled JavaScript, the source map, and run it through that tool, and you'll be able to mouse over and stuff, and you can figure out, like, if you're running something in, you know, IE 10, and it says, oh, it's on line 15, column 22,000, right, you can at least kind of scroll over to see what's going on there. Um, so you have to kind of hack around with it. But, you know, browsers are evergreen these days. Hopefully this stuff will kind of get better over time. Or just pray that you only have problems in, you know, the latest version of IE and Chrome. <laughs> All right, that's it. Thanks, guys.